That's right, everyone. You're listening to Bridging the Gap on the Jersey First TV Network. And as always, I'm AJ Malillo, and I'm joined with and my wonderful co-host. I'm Steve Robolo. <laughs> yes, and uh, you can catch all of your Jersey First related content on our YouTube, Jersey First TV. You can also check us out on jerseyfirst.org, where you can catch all of Bridging the Gap, the Nader Narrow, and then Real Talk with Fernando. You can check us out on Spotify. Just search up Jersey First TV. And if you're on jerseyfirst.org, you can check out our newsletter and sign up for the pledge of always putting New Jersey first. And speaking of, you know, putting New Jersey first, one thing about Stephen and I, if you've been listening, you know, is that we are both in law school. So we are putting school first at this point. Unlike all of our Ivy League friends, Stephen, we have finals coming up. What is going on and how is that going? <laughs> that, that was just an insanely awesome intro right there. <laughs> That was that was that maybe the best that you've done ever. That was that was incredible. <laughs> uh, you're absolutely correct. It is we are Jersey first, but right now it is for me uh, property first. And I've been trudging my way through this book, as we can see by my bookmark. I'm almost done. I've basically, you know, picked through all the readings that I've done over this past semester, reread them, retook notes, re-outlined, basically taught myself uh, the entire class over here. So got a little bit left to go. And my first final is property 9am this coming Monday. It's like I'm gearing up. I feel like I was going to say LeBron in finals mode, but I know they're not in the, uh, in the finals anymore. So I actually, you know what? I know the Orlando magic for whatever reason is apparently doing really well. And forced game six that's going to be home this Friday. So whoever the star player for the Orlando Magic is, that's how I'm feeling right now. I'm I'm gearing up. I'm ready to show up and uh, just just finish with finals. It's been a lot of stress, and um, but getting through, make, making it happen. And I feel good about my other classes. I feel like I'm in a great spot. I can't wait for it to all be done, and I can take those next steps. Look forward to some internships, putting some of this education that I've gained this past year to use over the summer. And so I think it's going to be very exciting. It'll, it'll be a good time. And as for this week, had an incredible week. My dad was actually down here the past two days on a uh, secret little work trip. And I got to drive, learn. well, I got to ride on and then learn to drive an airboat which I think is the most Florida man thing I've done to date. Absolutely. Were you in a in, swamp? We were. We well, Actually, yeah. we were. I'll give you a fun fact that I learned yesterday. We were on the St. John River, which is near Cocoa, Florida. And the guy that was teaching us told us that is one of only three north flowing rivers in the United States. Interesting. Which I thought was a fun little fact. Now, I do think that the next appropriate question is, did you see any gators? Oh, so many gators, so nice. many gators, big gators, really, really big gators that look like they would do heinous things to a human body. <laughs> it was, it, it was pretty the awesome. First gators that you saw while living in Florida. First wild gators, yes, one hundred percent. And there was also so the area that we were on actually sat up against its its private land. But they allow, the guy was explaining it, but essentially it's a cow pasture, but like hundreds of acres. So this same river we were going around, there was cows in the water and stuff. And so we were talking to him about, you know, these cows are just kind of hanging out and there's gators less than 20 feet from some of these, you know, little baby cows and stuff. And I actually, I learned a lot about Florida wildlife yesterday. Apparently the gators don't attack the cows during the day. For whatever reason that is, they wait till the nighttime and they try and strike the younger ones. So like the little calves and stuff. So I didn't get to see any like animal planet, you know, crazy stuff. But I found out that there's tons of cows roaming around. Apparently they have a wild hog problem down here. Similar I'm to sure Texas. The gators love that. I'm sure the, the gators, gators love that. do love that. And the other cool thing that I learned, which I don't know how to get into it, but I'm really considering trying to figure it out. Because of the population of gators in the state of Florida, they have to relocate a lot of the eggs when these mothers nest and lay eggs. And so you basically, any civilian can go and apply for this license, and then you're allowed to go into the swamps and find these gator nests and 
like take the eggs out and bring them to there's gator farms down here. I didn't, I learned all of this yesterday. It's, it's been blowing my mind. There's gator farms and stuff. And I learned that if you're going to harvest a gator egg, they travel sh with Sharpies and you have to draw a straight line in the orientation that you find the egg because something about the gator eggs, if you rotate them, it messes the position of the embryo up and essentially terminates like that, you know, soon to be gator. So this guy was saying that him and his buddies apply every year. They get the license. They go out in the middle of the night on their airboats. And one guy, he's like, this is the most Florida stuff I've ever heard in my life. He said, one guy just has a stick, fends off the mother gator. While the other dude, like, mark the eggs and pick them up and put them in the boat. And they just drive off. They, like, lose. But they pick up 80 to 90, he said, every day. And it's a two-week period. So you got to imagine if every crew is picking up about 100 gator eggs a day for 14 days. You're talking about every crew of people that does this in the entire state of Florida is picking up 1,000 gator eggs. How many alligators are actually in the state of Florida? It's it's remarkable. An insane, an insane amount of alligators. It's remarkable. So had a great week learning, studying, becoming a Florida man more and more. <laughs> Still Jersey first. It is always, forever. And always will be Jersey first, regardless of where I am. That's fair. That's fair. But I mean, when you can learn about living dinosaurs that walk amongst us, you got to you gotta take every advantage you can. This is true. This is true. But how about you? You are much closer to the end of the uh, finals journey than I am. Yeah, you know, I've just been pushing off my last take-home final for the last week. I could get it done. I could have gotten it done last week. I just kind of pushed it off. Didn't feel like it. So um, I'm probably going to start it today, and I'll finish up criminal procedure, and then I will be completely done with uh, the second year of law school, which is crazy. Two out of three, Steve. Two out of three. And you know what they no, say. I've I was just going to say, I've heard from a reliable source that two out of three ain't bad. So, <laughs> I mean... Mr. Meatloaf, Meatloaf, Meatloaf has told me that. Yeah, so uh, we're almost there. We are in the home stretch, I'd say. And this has been a tough semester for me. I'm sure you can go back over the episodes this semester and you'll see bags on bags under my eyes and stressed out and like just exhausted and tired. And I can't wait for it to be over. But I do think this was a fruitful semester. I learned a lot. I kind of put my nose to the grindstone. I got through it. And I'm really hoping that on the other end of this, it's going to pay off with good grades this semester. Maybe, hopefully, a GPA a little boost up. That would be nice. Not, you know, not the end of the world if it doesn't happen, if I maintained where I was. But a little boost would be a nice reward for such a, a taxing semester. Absolutely. And it's, it's, I know you said it, but it's just worth repeating that, it, you know, you're coming on to the last lap essentially of, of what is a really difficult and uh you know taxing journey and so that's a lot to be proud of and so i'm certain that once you turn in this last final it'll be a kind of a big sigh of relief and then another deep inhale as you as you brace for the final push that's coming around the corner luckily i'll have like four months to or three months to not have to think about that really too much so this, that is true. Be nice. this is That'll true this is true but Steve, we got some stories to go to talk about. And I think that the best place to start with these stories, which is um, basically a continuation of what we talked about last week, and that is all of these protests and now actual takeovers of college campuses in not just the Ivy Leagues, but across the country, across the coast, so in the middle of the country, on the East Coast, on the West Coast, of these students who are protesting for Palestine, um, and uh, there's a couple of things. First of all, I think the first place to start is we're going to look at the responses of President Joe Biden and uh, President Trump, and we'll see the juxtaposition of how they're handling the situation. But then on top of that, I just want this to be known and, and just be as straightforward and honest with it as, as I can. Obviously, you have the First Amendment right to protest. And I think that it goes without saying that Stephen, you and I completely support that. Even if we disagree with the message and what they are, are protesting, these students have the right to stand out there with their signs, to put their kefias on, and to, you know, even hang out on the on the college greens. And you know what? Here's the thing. 
Uh, I don't even care if they're pitching tents on these college greens. You know, like whatever. It doesn't really matter to me that co- that these Columbia students, these you know, uh, Portland State University students are like putting up tents on their own college green. That whatever. It doesn't really bother, bother me. What bothers me is when you're starting to actively prevent Jewish students from entering buildings. When you're starting to chant things like we want more October 7th. I want like, I'm pretty sure it was like, I want like a thousand of October 7th to happen. So now you're actually calling for like the death of innocent people. Like you, what moral high ground do you possibly have? You know? And then not only that, what really bothers me is when you go into these buildings of, and these institutions of higher learning and you destroy them. And we'll show some pictures really quickly about like what the university of Port, uh, Portland State University looks like um, in their library. And it's like, okay, this is your institution of higher learning. This is your library. You should have pride in this. And they're spray painting the walls, free Gaza. They are, this is a non-violence occupation. Don't harm the books. Okay, yeah, great. Um, it sounds real edgy. Except for the fact that they're actively cutting chairs with saws and and creating barricades. Oh, look at this nice picture of somebody studying in the madness. Um, and then like destroying garbage cans and stacking chairs and boarding up windows. And that's just Portland. Okay, Portland's a little crazy. But like Columbia, it's the same thing. They, they're locking up these places and they're preventing people from coming in and out. And then they try and act like these revolutionaries and we'll hear a student talk about it where they're like barricading themselves, but then they don't get fed for four hours. And it's like, you're oppressing us or something. It's like, you're not, you're not what you think you are. And we'll get more into that. But I I just want to note, like you have the right to be on that college green and say your silly chants that are genocidal and stupid. And you have the right to hold your signs and and show that you're pro a terrorist organization and Hamas all you want. I have the right to call you out as being moronic and not knowing what you're talking about just as much as you have the right to do it. Okay, fine. What you don't have the right to do is destroy property. What you don't have the right to do is barricade yourself into buildings of learning. What you don't have the right to do is blocking other people from entering those buildings based off of their religion. Like that's where your peaceful protest becomes not a protest anymore and not peaceful anymore. And so you can't sit there and cry and complain when these institutions then call the police to get you out because you are no longer exercising your First Amendment rights. And we have to stop pretending that you have a First Amendment right to to destroy a building. Because why? Because you don't want the school to support Israel anymore like uh, uh, okay like that doesn't <laughs> give you the right to spray paint walls and to destroy windows and to cut up chairs and to barricade a building it doesn't the first amendment doesn't give you that right and nothing you're fighting for about a war 10,000 miles away gives you that right completely correct completely correct and i think just to to, to speak my piece on this before we actually look at any of these uh, statements that everybody else made, because apparently people on the internet don't, don't seem to have a grasp on this stuff. The bill of rights exists as protections for your mine, every citizen's rights and the first amendment, the, the things that the founding fathers felt so important, to be protected, to ensure a free society include these very rights of speech and protest. They are among the most important to protect in a citizenry to ensure that our freedom persists. So to suggest that any of the criticisms 
that either one of us levy against these students uh, appear to be in opposition of the principles of the First Amendment is completely ridiculous, and it, it is proves that you've not listened to a single word that's come out of either of our mouths. Because so long as I've I've understood what those things are, I've been nothing but a vehement supporter, and and, and I love the cons. Oh, I love the Constitution. I love that I live in a country where I have the freedom to speak my mind, where I have the freedom to go and protest against the government, because that's what this is. I'm all about, you know, sticking it to the man that that's, you know, that's, that's my, my vibe over here. And, but I agree with you. What you don't have is the right to then violently occupy buildings, violently attack students, fellow students, your your neighbors, your your classmates, the people that you're supposed to be sitting in class with, you don't have the right to sit and scream and cry and complain that the universities are withholding humanitarian aid, basic aid, when you're the one that marched in there and locked everybody out. So, so there's a lot of confusion here. And I, I just think the other thing that's really super important for me to mention before we talk about any of this is this is the same group of people this is the same collective ideology these young you know people on these college campuses that tend to have liberal teachings and liberal beliefs that would be the first to call uh, quite frankly you or i for the opinions that we have fascists or nazis or something like i mean we were called nazis on tiktok in all fairness Do, is 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 it it, it's glaring to me, and I don't know how it's not so obvious to those people. I'm not standing on a college campus preventing a Jewish student from going to school. So I don't know how I'm the Nazi. When these people are literally prohibiting Jewish individuals from going to a school that they paid money to go to, that is the Nazi behavior. And so if you're going to invoke such a hateful, an abhorrent ideology as Nazism, make sure that it's properly directed because, again, neither one of us are standing on the steps preventing Jewish students from going anywhere or doing anything. I would like all of the students at all of these universities to be able to go to class, to study, to take their finals and pass and graduate and go into the workforce and be productive Americans and contribute to society because that's what good citizens and good students and good people do bad people prevent others from achieving the success that they deserve you know steven i just have one thing to say after that um you just sound like a nazi no, I'm <laughs> um yeah it's just, you know calling out people for preventing from preventing jewish students from getting an education that sounds like being a nazi i don't know like that's what it sounds like <laughs> but the, the hypocrisy of this movement things. The hypocrisy of this movement is is unfathomable. It's unfathomable. And no, you're right. I, I just I, again, I don't I don't know. Also, on top of all this, we are not that much older than these kids protesting. I you know what I mean? I was just in college not a short time ago. And so I totally get it. And it scares me that these are my quote unquote peers because I, 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 it's Steven. Okay. Protests on college campuses have been going on for ages, but like I, these people think that, and I think we talked about this last week, but I'm just going to say it again. They think they're the civil rights activists of our time. They think they're the anti-Vietnam Vietnam protesters of our time. But what they get wrong is that they are on the wrong side of the issue for that. They are actively on the side of the on the side of this issue of the terrorist organization of Hamas, which oppresses women, oppresses the LGBT community, oppresses literally everybody under their auspices, right? And then actively prevent people of a certain religious class from entering buildings. Like, how do you not see that you're on the opposite side of this civil rights fight? How do you not see that, like, it's not the... Your, American men and women aren't being sent via draft 
across the sea to fight in this war. Like, you're not, you're not on the side you think you are. And you know what, Stephen? I'll, I'll let you go, and then and then we'll we'll show this. When you lose, not only when you have former President Trump against you, you also have the current President Joe Biden against you. And when you lose Reverend Al Sharpton, that tells you that like. You got this completely wrong. And if I am agreeing with Al Sharpton on anything, like that should tell you how wrong you really are. It, you, 100, 100% correct. And I mean, I think you even, you were telling me yesterday, I, I believe even Gavin Newsom came out against these protests. That's correct? Yeah, Gavin Newsom came out against them at USC too. Like, <laughs> you don't have anybody on your side. Mm -hmm. It's it's not just, even the most radical remarkable. members of the left. No, and and to to your point on on all of this about you know if you want to you think you're the civil rights is that or whatever I still and, and I've been diligent in my effort to attempt to understand what motivates these kids to go and do this. I still have yet to really come across a logical or reasonable explanation for what these protests actually are calling for. I understand that these students want these universities to, you know, divest their ties with Israel, but what is Columbia? What is USC? What is UCLA? What is Rutgers who, who now is, you know, suffering from, you know, these protests, what do all of these universities have to do with Israel, I, I'm very confused. And and it, it, are these universities sending money to Israel? Or are they like I, I genuinely don't know. Portland State had like a deal with Boeing that they pulled out of, and that was like their big their big push. It's like you know Boeing is producing weaponry for Israel. But it's like, do they not realize that they're also producing weaponry for Hamas? Like these these military. Okay, we can be against the military industrial complex. Like you and I both are that, and like fine, whatever. It is what it is. We we agree that that's not good. But like to pretend like these. Like, first of all, U.S. taxpayer dollars aren't only going to Israel. Guess what? The Biden administration is sending pallets of cash, and the Obama administration did the same. They sent pallets of cash to Iran. Money is fungible. Who's funding Hamas? Iran. So who's funding Iran? Who's funding Hamas indirectly? The United States. Like, the missiles that are being flown across over there are all paid for by the United States. So you want us to divest from Israel? Like. We're also investing in the other side of this war, like we do in every war, because that's what we do. And like, it's bad, I agree, but like, it is what it, like, it, it, like divesting from one side is divesting from all sides. So you're really just shooting yourself in the foot. And if you really want peace, if you really want a ceasefire, one side of this issue, if there was a, a call for a ceasefire, Okay, maybe October 7th might have changed things because it was a direct and brutal terrorist terroristic attack on children that were like the hippies of Israel that were on the side of like calling for the ending of occupation and border and the border regime of Israel. Like, okay, so you killed the people that were on your side and that has sent Israel in a much more aggressive posture. But before October 7th, if, if on October 6th, they came to the table and said, we want a solution where both of these states lived in, in harmony, it wasn't Israel that was going to stop it. And if you think anything else, you're just ill-informed. I, I um, think on all sorry, of this, you no, no, you're good. I was going to say on all of this, I, I just think it's the other issue that I find to be so pervasive through this whole thing is this is a conflict that stems from quite literally thousands of years of conflict in this region. And so I think it's foolish for these students. I, I mean, anybody really truly to believe that one protest or, or one couple weeks of protest is somehow going to cast a magic spell and it's going to be, you know, sunshine and rainbows 
in the Gaza Strip. Are you joking? This this has this this is a serious. It's going to require pure diplomacy, extreme negotiation, a lot of parties. And guess what? You know who will never be invited to the negotiation of a two state solution for the state of Israel and Gaza and the West Bank and all the regions over there? College students from Columbia or college students from UCLA. They don't even deserve a seat at the table. And so I don't know why they are upending the lives of their classmates of this country. To, to attempt to solve a conflict that they don't have a seat at the table in. It, it's bananas to me that we are wasting our time as a nation, as a country. Joe Biden has to come out today and hope in his old mouth for the first time in, in front of some cameras and talk about this. Donald Trump is running around talking about it. You have every major, you know, talking head talking about it. Gavin, everybody's talking about it. Why don't we talk about, you know, the, the bill that just criminalized you know, speech about the Bible. Why don't we talk about, again, I'll say it every time, the million illegal immigrants that have walked across our open border for the past and flown three across. years and flown across. We have a seat at the table there, but we don't want to talk about those things. We don't want to turn the world upside down for those things. It makes no sense to me. You're describing the, the generation of slacktivism and and internet proliferation where everything is right uh, where you think you have a say in everything and everything is a global issue because it's all right in front of you and you're talking about a generation of people that have been raised on the only thing that matters the most quintessential right that you have is the right to be to protest and and be heard and it's like that's an important right it is, it is an important right as an American. It 100% is. You have the right to speak your mind. You have the right to protest. Stephen, just protesting to for the sake of protesting is not what makes you a good, free, de democratic citizen. Like not producing for your society and the people around you and freely using your free will and and the gifts that you were given and the natural talents that you that you have to make the world a better place that is what the key to freedom is and we have trained people and taught people that the only way to be a viable citizen in this country is through your right to protest and your right to speech and it's just like it's important it's not what makes you a good american you know, no, uh, but no. anyway, and I'll this, let you get this, this point. Be, we should, we do need to go to yes. the clip. Yes. This, this will be my last piece on this. It, and it, the other, the other thing, and, and I feel like I can say this because like I said before, we are not much older than these people, but I certainly have more degrees than these people. <laughs> um, because I was able to go and finish my studies and take my finals to earn those degrees, obviously. Um, why are we allowing actual children who have not stepped out once into the real world, probably worked a full-time job? I'm not, I, again, I don't mean to, I'm obviously making broad general statements and attack me for that as, as you please. But largely speaking, these kids who attend these expensive universities that, you know, living on loans that they also want the taxpayers to pay for at the same time that they scream death to America. Why are we letting them claim moral high ground and tell the rest of this country of actual adults who have successfully gone through, gotten their education, gotten the jobs, done the work, lived life, had experiences? Why are we letting these kids run a conversation? We don't negotiate. You don't negotiate with a toddler. Right. So so why are we as a nation negotiating with a bunch of screaming and crying babies? It makes no sense to me. Well, Stephen, I believe the children are the future and we have to let them show the way. So. <laughs> Let's see what Joe Biden has to say about it all. <laughs> Joe Biden has to say. Good morning. Before I head to North Carolina, I wanted to speak a few moments about what's going on on our college campuses here. We've all seen the images. 
and they put to the test two fundamental American principles. Excuse me. <clears throat> the first is the right to free speech and for people to peacefully assemble and make their voices heard. The second is the rule of law. Both must be upheld. We are not an authoritarian nation where we silence people or squash dissent. The American people are heard. In fact, peaceful protest is in the best tradition of how Americans respond to consequential issues. But, but, neither are we a lawless country. <clears throat> we are a civil society. An order must prevail. Throughout our history, we've often faced moments like this because we are a big, diverse, free-thinking, and freedom-loving nation. In moments like this, there are always those who rush in to score political points. But this isn't a moment for politics. It's a moment for clarity. So let me be clear. Peaceful protest in America. Violent protest is not protected. Peaceful protest is. It's against the law when violence occurs. Destroying property is not a peaceful protest. It's against the law. Vandalism, trespassing, breaking windows, shutting down campuses, forcing the cancellation of classes and graduations. None of this is a peaceful protest. Threatening people, intimidating people, instilling fear in people is not a peaceful protest. It's against the law. Dissent is essential to democracy, but dissent must never lead to disorder or to denying the rights of others so students can finish the semester and their college education. It sounds like we're saying exactly what Joe Biden says, like word for word. He almost took our quotes. Now let's, let's see what his competitor, former President Trump, has to say on the issue. The radical extremists and far-left agitators are terrorizing college campuses, as you possibly noticed, and Biden's nowhere to be found. He hasn't said anything. But they're his political base. Do you think if he did say, okay, look, let's not get ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, President Biden is coming to give you his words of inspiration. Now, does anybody think that it will be so inspiring that everybody will say, oh, we have to go home. We love our country. No. They'll say, do you believe the guy that's the president of that country? This guy, he is, he is, yeah, he needs something. Now think of it, but he hasn't been heard from. You know, he's the president. When you have a problem like that, you should go out and talk about it and talk to the people. But there's a big problem. There's a big fever in our country and he's not talking, but if he did, it wouldn't matter. In fact, I think it would actually make it worse. Many of them aren't even students, you know, and many of them come from foreign countries. You know, thousands and thousands are from foreign countries. I was wondering about that. I'm saying, where did these people come from? To every college president, I say, remove the encampments immediately, vanquish the radicals, and take back our campuses for all of the normal students who want a safe place from which to learn. Obviously, those remarks were made before President Biden spoke today, because uh, we're recording this on Thursday. But um, I Look, essentially, at the end of the day, they're saying the exact same thing, right? Correct. So, okay, now let's go to a third party, which is the Reverend Al Sharpton, who, again, if I'm agreeing with Al Sharpton on something, you're doing something incredibly wrong. How do the Democrats, how do all of us on that side say January 6th was wrong if you could have the same pictures going on on college campus. Good Lord, don't make you a parallel with January 6th. You lose For the some moral reason, high That has happened, though. Okay, that so has just happened. Uh, so we know what's going on here. Uh... My favorite part of that clip is Minka Prezinski trying to, like, withhold that these protests have nothing in common with like the rating of the Capitol on January 6th because Al Sharpton is like drawing this comparison between the two, which is like clear. You have like mobs of students taking over these classic institutions of higher learning and destroying building, destroying the building, vandalizing it. So look, the overall point of all of these three people is like you have lost your supposed moral high ground now. You are just 
vandalizing and violently protesting. You can't call this a peaceful protest. Why? Because you're not like punching people in the streets. Like that's not that's not what peaceful means. Peaceful means but like they're doing that there. too. Well, I, I know they're doing that too, but like peaceful means you're sitting there. You're maybe doing some drum circles and you're you know smoking pot in the college green and nobody cares but taking over buildings destroying property punching people in the streets blocking people from entering that's not peaceful you don't know what you are doing you are not very bright clearly which speaks it speaks to our education our systems of higher education because they just don't know what basic terms like peaceful mean it's it's I, I would agree with you. And I, I think that there was, I mean, certainly probably not appropriate for us to play on this forum, but you can go and find it. There was protesters, I believe in California yesterday, two sides. There was Gaza, like pro Gaza protesters literally across the street from each other with people protesting against them. And at the same time, an F Joe Biden chant broke out between both of the parties. And, and so I think it's it's crazy because when you look at it to your point and and what those clips that you just said illustrated is there is some unity here and it's that these people you know in the infighting think that Joe Biden's a problem Joe Biden's saying hey you guys are crazy let kids learn Donald Trump is saying you guys are crazy let kids learn Al Sharpton is saying you guys are crazy let kids learn Gavin Newsom insert whoever you want, and they are guaranteed almost to say the same exact thing. And so I just don't know how we move forward from here because if, if you saw the scenes, especially out of Columbia with the way that the NYPD raided some of these, but it was a true raid. Like I, I saw videos, uh, it looked like a mile long of just police walking onto campus with the trucks and the guns and the riot gear and all of this stuff. And what I'm concerned about, obviously, is you know the natural conclusion of this how does this end but how do we move forward what what do we do with these students because in my opinion and i'm sure a lot of people would agree with this they should never be allowed back to a college period if you are so willing to to destroy the place that has you know selected you to come and participate in this, what should be a symbiotic relationship of you're showing up, you're engaging, you're participating. We're getting all these great faculty. We're providing you a safe space, classrooms, guest speakers, professors, all of these tools to gain knowledge and go out and be a productive citizen. You spat in the face of that. You spray painted our walls. You broke our windows. You destroyed our property. Why should you be allowed back to go and finish your degree? You shouldn't. You threw it all away. For what? Something that you don't have a seat at the table to talk about. Something that you will never genuinely, I don't believe in our lifetime, in the next lifetime, in 10 lifetimes, we will see a natural, peaceful conclusion to the conflict in, in, in that particular region of the Middle East. And I don't say that to sound like, you know, not hopeful of peace and this, that, or whatever. I just think history provides a great example. And we should look at that example and learn from it. And understand that this is a loaded conflict. These are children, and they have taken extreme and drastic measures that don't actually contribute to solving this problem. It's heinous. Does anybody want to see innocent children, Gazan or Israeli, die? No, nobody wants to see innocent people die. But there's better ways to challenge you know, the issues that face our world. There are better ways to go out and show your support. There's better ways to organize. There's more effective ways to protest. What this is, is senseless destruction by a bunch of children. There's no other way to slice it. Absolutely. And Stephen, let's hear from those, the, the best and brightest among us, those children that are protesting will start in our home state, University of Rutgers.
just like shrieking um and the other thing too is that like actively they're calling for the destruction of israel right so it's like you can't see you can't see that you're actively calling for the death of millions of people and then you're talking about they're killing sons and they're killing daughters about the same people that like stone gate stone throw stones at gay people um you're also talking about like they they they're literally just shrieking into microphones and putting it to like beats like I, I they're saying empty platitudes that mean nothing about issues that are more complex than they can even imagine and then they expect people to just like what bow to their knees and like i said in i said i said in Last week's show, the one thing about all of these people is that they're all covering their face. They're either wearing masks or they're wearing kefias. It's like, why are you covering your face? Say it with your chest if you believe it so much. Let me see who you are. You don't want me to see who you are. Why? There's multiple reasons. Either you don't believe what you're saying, you know what you're saying is horrendous, or what, you're that scared of COVID? that you're outside chanting and sleeping in tents with strangers. Like, come on. Like you, what, what game are we playing? You, I have never seen Steven in the course, in the course of, of all of the history that I've studied, the good guys wearing masks while they were chanting and, and attacking buildings. You know what? How many of those civil rights protesters in those pictures where they stared down cops and they they were fighting uh, segregation in schools were wearing masks? No, they were proudly displaying themselves. They were taking the slings, literal the slings and arrows and and bullets that came against them, and, and as horrendous as it was, and they were saying, "No, we're fighting for something right." How many Correct. times are the good guys wearing masks, Stephen? That's what I want to know. Never, never. And I think it's because it's implicit in, in the concept of civil disobedience. If you believe wholeheartedly to the point where you are willing to throw away your education, to desecrate historic buildings, to spit in the face of the police and do all of these things, you should really believe the words that are coming out of your mouth. Because if you don't, You've set yourself up for failure. You're, you're, you're throwing away your future for something you don't even believe in, and that's foolish in its own right. When I sat here just a few minutes ago and said, I love the Constitution. I'm happy that I live in a country where we have the freedoms and protections that we do. I say that with an open chest. I say it with my name right here. You see my face. You know who I am. I'm not ashamed of this. I'm not afraid of the consequences of, of loving this country. And so... I think to your point, precisely, if you have to hide your face, you can make a compelling argument and it would appeal to me because again, I'm, you know, maybe a little anti-establishment that you don't want the government keeping tabs of you and your attendance at these protests and this, that, or whatever. A government surveillance, I'd, I'd listen to the argument, but I don't think that's what this is. I think that these people don't want their faces plastered all over uh, social media. I remember when this was happening early in fall of last year, they were actually driving those trucks around with the students' faces on them, and maybe they're afraid of the consequences of that. Even back then, there was backlash from employers saying, hey, if you're one of these people, you're never getting a job. And that alone should have scared these kids because your financial and, and job security in the future is, is should be a huge consideration of your life at this point if you're in college about to leave and enter the workforce. But you're hiding your face because you're ashamed. You have to hide behind something because you are ashamed. You probably don't really even believe it. I bet you, like you said the last time, a lot of those guys out or guys and gals are out there because, oh, it's what my friends are doing and 
well, if Timmy, Jimmy, and Kayla are skipping class, I don't want to go by myself. I might as well just go out there anyway. And it's it's stupid. The whole thing is just so damn stupid. And I think it highlights what is is truly and, and it's it's magnifying what I think is a really big issue. There is something so broken right now with the education in this country as a whole, the way that we are teaching children and, and preparing them to become productive members of society. And as much as I want to sit here and I want to, you know, make the funny little quips and crack the jokes and, you know, say all these things about these, these kids. I do think that a, a great citizen would take responsibility. I think that the system has clearly failed these children, that they don't see the hypocrisy, that they don't understand why exactly what they're doing is wrong. And I think that we need to be better as a country and we need to reel in the education system. We need to make sure that our children have these better values, that they understand maybe a civics class would have helped all these kids to understand how to functionally use these rights that they, you know, scream and cry and, and claim that they're using. Now we need to learn how to be productive citizens. When you live in a country that affords you as many freedoms with, with great freedom comes great responsibility essentially. And so if you want to go out and you want to exercise your rights, you better do it responsibly and you better understand the gravity of everything that comes with that. And all of the cascading effects and outcomes that happen as a result of your advocacy. It's it's important. It, I agree with what Joe Biden said. You, you need dissent. Dissent is essential in a democracy, but it has to be done the right way. We have systems, we have procedures, and it's all to make sure that we can facilitate productive and safe conversations to get on, on the other side of the issue. I forget who said it, but I heard it recently where somebody... Uh, it was one of those conservatives that goes and like sits at a college campus and causes a ruckus. Basically said that the minute you stop having conversations with people that you disagree with, it becomes really easy to not see them as a person. And it becomes easier and easier to execute violence and speak poorly and speak harshly. And all of those things snowball and snowball and snowball and they build to what we have now, which is all out chaos amongst Americans, amongst people that should be sharing these facilities, that should be wanting to grow together, to, to be a generation and a force for good, a force for change. This generation has the world at their fingertips. They are the first tech generation. They're you know more savvy with AI and all this great technology that's coming out. And there's infinite potential to go and do great things, but they would rather spend their days screaming and shouting into microphones, hiding their faces, destroying buildings, not going to school, preventing Jewish students from getting an education and claiming that they have the right side of history. It, it's, it makes no sense to me. And I think at some point we have to acknowledge that there was a greater failure somewhere down the road on behalf of all of us that we let our kids get to this point to begin with. Absolutely, Stephen. I couldn't have said it better. Um, we do have one more video that... I want to share and uh, just to see like the leaders of our revolutionaries of our time in their, uh, you know, it seems like crop tops and jean jackets. Why should the university be obligated to provide food to people who have taken over a building? Uh, well, for, first of all, we're saying that they're obligated to provide food to students who pay for a meal plan here. But you mentioned that there was a request that the food and water be brought in. To allow it to be brought in, I mean, well, I guess it's ultimately a question of what kind of community and obligation Columbia feels it has to its students. Um, do you want students to die of dehydration and starvation or get severely ill, even if they disagree with you? If the answer is no, then you should allow basic, I mean, it's crazy to say because we're on an Ivy League campus, but this is like basic humanitarian aid we're asking for. Like, could people please have a glass of water? But they, they, they did put themselves in that very deliberately in that situation and in that position. So it, it seems like you're sort of saying, we want to be revolutionaries, we want to take up this building, now would you please bring us food and water? And Nobody's food. asking them to bring anything. Every, we're, we're asking them to not violently stop us from bringing in basic humanitarian doing, aid. They're 
here stopping their delivery of food? I th we are looking for a commitment from them that they will not stop oh, it. But they haven't stopped it yet. We, well, I don't. I'm not. I don't know to what extent it has been attempted, but we're looking for a commitment. So I mean, look, there's so many different ways that we could go and attack that clip, but I think like the most honest one is that they were in there for a couple of hours and they're talking about like dying of dehydration. It's like. <laughs> Please grow up. Like you can't go four hours without a glass of water. Are you serious? And also, you're like you've taken over an academic building. Are you telling me there's no water fountains in there? And then, okay, so then now they need a glass of water. They they need a promise that nobody is going to violently stop them from getting food and drink. And it's like they go, well, have they done that yet? And she's like, yeah, I, you know, uh, I don't really know. It's like. <laughs> what are you even talking about then? Like, what are you even talking about? They're not stopping that is the answer. You know that. And you want to just like play this victim card of like, you're this righteous revolutionary and you're sticking it to the man when I'm sure if they asked, if they like ordered Grubhub, nobody would stop it from entering the building, right? Like this, Stephen, and, and I'll let you get the last point before we wrap up, but I, I just think it illustrates exactly the problem with these kids and the way that they're protesting is that they want so hard to be revolutionaries. And then when it comes down to like actually putting your face on the line, your name on the line, your body on the line for this deep humanitarian issue that you believe in, you can't even last three hours without your glass of water provided by the school. Like, you know what? At the end, at the end of the day, those kids that were doing this in the late fifties and sixties and the late sixties and seventies, they were actually revolutionaries. They were actually putting their bodies on the line. They actually cared about what they were talking about, and they weren't just doing it to get laid. Like, if you actually care about this, you wouldn't be begging for water after four hours of locking yourself in an air-conditioned building in New York City. I, you're not on a hunger strike, and it, and it, it, it echoes. There's, there's, you can look it up. Like these, like in the past, there's been these like quote-unquote hunger strikes where it's like we've lasted twelve hours without eating, and it's like oh, so you intermittent passive. Congratulations, <laughs> welcome to anybody that listens to Joe Rogan. Like they all do that. Like, <laughs> like you're not who you think you are. You're whining children that don't know a thing that haven't picked up a book. Correct. And that's the end of it. And Stephen, I'm going to let you get the last word, but we do have to wrap up. We do. We do. What I'll say about that clip specifically, and this, this has just been, I think, the common thread that I've been pulling the entire time. For some reason, for some reason, the media decided to put that woman in front of a microphone and allow her to talk. And she says that there is an obligation on behalf of Columbia University to not withhold food for the students that paid for a meal plan. How about the students that spent tens of thousands of dollars to go to class? How about the obligation that the university owes to them that you, lady behind the microphone who doesn't know a thing about what she's talking about, you and everybody that you stand to represent are preventing Columbia from upholding that obligation. How about that one? The hypocrisy is glaring. It is in our face. It, it's shame on the media for putting that person behind a microphone, filming it, and sending it out for the world to see because it's a non-contribution. It highlights more hypocrisy. It further entrenches this conflict. Put the, put the kids that don't go to class, put the kids that want to go and earn their degree and become productive, give them the microphone. I want to hear what their experiences are because that's what matters to me. They also have an obligation that Columbia owes them an obligation. All of these schools owe them an obligation. I don't care about your meal plan. I care about the kids that since they were children, I'm talking 
kindergarten, first grade that wanted nothing more than to graduate and go to college, go and, and earn a degree and put their family in a better position. Those are the kids whose voices I want to hear from because the university has an obligation to them to honor the commitment that they made when they accepted them to come to the university and provide them that education, give them the tools to succeed, to go and chase their dreams. What about that obligation? Because that sounds way more righteous than you locking yourself in a building for four hours and complaining that you don't have water or food. I don't give a damn. I don't give a damn. It's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. Absolutely, Stephen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let it at that because I couldn't have said it better. And I think that's a perfect way to end. So for Jersey First TV and Bridging the Gap, I'm AJ Malillo. I'm Steven Rombolo, and I'm proud of everything that I said. I don't got to hide my face. And if you got a problem with it, talk to me in the comments about it because I'll answer. <laughs> I'm not going to sit here and I run and hide. I love it, Steven. I, I echo the same sentiment. Um, I hope everybody has a lovely week. We'll talk to you next week.